Welcome to Box Church. We are so glad you have joined us. We want you to participate in this time gathered with your box. We want you to crank up the volume and sing with all your might. Clap. Be intimate with the Lord. Be excited about praising Him. Let Him be your audience as you worship. If you want to go off to a quiet place and lay face down before the Lord, you do that. This is a time in which we want you to encounter Jesus in a real way in the safety of real community. After the message is over, there will be some discussion questions for you to talk about. Be open and transparent during that time. You never know how your story and your struggles may help someone sitting right around you. And as you gather together in your box, know that you are joining with people in other parts of the world, worshiping in this exact same way. So what are you waiting for? Let's stand to our feet and get excited about worshiping our risen Savior.
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging Righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord Savior, I 
Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. I bow, worldly pleasure all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me. Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. Amen. Have we surrendered everything to Jesus? I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Or do we have Christ compartmentalized? Well, this is my Jesus time, and this is my time for work, and this is my time for this, and this is my time for that. We cannot compartmentalize Christ in our life. We have to totally surrender it to Him. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. You know, that's the the beginning of Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. That is total surrender. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. I have been crucified with Christ. As we continue in this time of worship, Let's just examine our hearts and our minds and just ask God, is there anything in my life that is keeping me from total surrender? And if there is something, Lord, please remove it. Help to rid it from my life. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Drink from 
It's more than I can stand. I'm melting your peace. It's overwhelming. Oh. The more I seek you. The more I love you, I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe and feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I'm in your peace it's overwhelming oh, I worship you Jesus Jesus When Paul talks about the spiritual armor in Ephesians 6 that we are to put on and appropriate, it is very clear that Paul wanted prayer to be included in the description of our spiritual armor. And you can hear the military language with which he uses to describe prayer. He says things like this, stay alert, be persistent. The main difference between this piece of spiritual armor and the others is that Paul does not make it analogous to anything. There's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and prayer. You know, prayer is such a mystical thing. What concrete object do you put with it to describe prayer? If only had, if Paul had Star Wars available for him to watch, he would have understood. Prayer, in my opinion, is like the force. It is the mystical, powerful, unseen, mind altering, object moving, covering, protecting weapon, listen, available to every believer. William Cowper, the great hymn writer, he once penned these words. Listen to him. It says this, restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer keeps the Christian's armor bright, and Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Because prayer, like the force, has a mystical element to it. And because of that, there is a lot of confusion when it comes to prayer. Here's the question, why pray? And I've asked myself this question many times. When Amy and I were first married, I worked at a 
furniture store in Jackson, Mississippi, in order to put her through occupational therapy school. And I had a unique job at the furniture store, really the only one of its kind. My job consisted of selling furniture, assembling furniture, and delivering furniture. So I could sell you a piece of furniture, assemble that piece of furniture, and then be the one who drops it off at your house not too long after that. Now that's customer service, correct? And when I was working in the warehouse, I remember one day talking to my delivery manager who was a very, very godly man. And I was talking with him about prayer and the conversation went something like this. So, do you really think prayer works? And without hesitation, he said to me, prayer moves the hand of God. And you know, I've thought about that for a long time. After college and even into my time in seminary, I just thought about and then I struggled in grasping the reason for prayer. And I knew that the Bible told me to pray. And I knew that from growing up in church that prayer is something that you try and you do and, and you attempt to engage in. But for some reason, I just couldn't figure out why we were to do it. And here was my dilemma. The sovereignty of God always stood in my way. And here's what I mean. If God is all sovereign and has the future mapped out and knows exactly what's going to happen next, then why pray? I mean, who am I to change the mind and the plan of Almighty God? And can those plans even be changed? And why would God want to change them anyway? Isn't he an all-knowing God and doesn't he know what's best? You see what I mean? The sovereignty of God kept standing in my way, but yet when I read my Bible, I see people praying as if prayer does change the heart and the hand of God. Let me ask you, have you ever examined the prayer life of Jesus? Let me give you a couple things. Jesus taught about prayer a lot. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. It says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. It was not if you pray, but when you pray. And then Luke chapter 11, 1 through 4, it says this, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Again, Jesus says this phrase, when you pray. And when asked how to pray, Jesus taught them. I noticed also this that Jesus engaged in prayer. And very often, we see Jesus on this earth retreating and disconnecting in order to pray. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
Look at Luke 5, 16. When, but when Jesus, he often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. And look at Matthew 14, 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Not only did Jesus teach about prayer, but he prayed. Jesus prayed. Notice also, Jesus got angry concerning prayer. Jesus often became angry with those around him who did not recognize the importance of prayer or prayed incorrectly. For instance, remember the time that Jesus cleansed the temple and he used a whip to chase everyone out. Remember that? Well, why did he do this? Well, notice Matthew 21, verse 13. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer but you have turned it into a den of thieves. He wanted prayer to be in his house. When Jesus and the disciples were in the synagogue, they noticed a religious leader and a lowly tax collector praying. And Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 6, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward that they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Jesus told his disciples, He says, don't be like the religious leader in your praying. When Jesus was in the garden, agonizing with his father about the monumental task that was set before him, about to endure the horrific suffering on the cruel cross, he asked his disciples to stay alert and to pray. And yet when he came back to check on them, he found them asleep. And because of that, he became angry. Look at Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit over here while I go over there to pray. And he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John. And he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Stay here and pray. Verse 39, he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. A gentle rebuke from Jesus Jesus often became angry when prayer was not happening or was being done incorrectly. Notice something else concerning Jesus. Jesus, at this moment, is praying. He's praying. I look at Romans chapter 8, verse 34. It says this, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Look at Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. 
and he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. So Jesus is interceding and praying for his chosen right now. Now, I want you to think about prayer and I want you to think about Jesus for one second. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is God in the flesh who is all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-present, and all-powerful, and yet Jesus prayed while on this earth, and he prayed consistently, and he prayed passionately, and Jesus became visibly upset when prayer was not carried out. And what is Jesus doing right now at the right hand of the throne of the Father? He is praying for you and me. But again, listen, my mind starts to wander as to why. Why did Jesus deem it necessary to pray? I mean, he's God incarnate. He and the Father are one, and he knows the future. Jesus in the gospel accounts is described as being all-knowing, reading people's thoughts and answering those thoughts before they are ever even spoken. And yet, listen, Jesus prayed. Let that sink in for one second. Jesus prayed, and he is currently praying right now in his glorified state. Now listen, listen to me very carefully. If Jesus found prayer to be vitally important, how more important should prayer be to us? Yet, even after hearing everything that I just said, there is still much confusion in people's minds about prayer because we see it as something mystical rather than something concrete. Well, let me give you something concrete. Crete when it concerns prayer. Are you ready? Here it is. God has attached himself to prayer. God has attached himself to prayer. And here's what I mean by that statement. When we pray, God works. And when we don't pray, he doesn't. I've become totally convinced of this truth. And this is just how he has chosen to work with his creation and operate in the world that he has created. Martin Luther describes his prayer life by saying this, I have so much business, I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Pastor and author David Jeremiah says this, the world is hardwired to work by prayer. And the great theologian Karl Barth said this about prayer, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. Let me ask you, if you were absolutely convinced that when you prayed, God worked, and when you didn't pray, he didn't. If you were absolutely convinced of that truth, would that cause you to pray more or would it cause you to pray less? And you would say, well, Pastor Matt, of course. It would cause me to pray more. Okay, listen. This is how Jesus understood prayer. This is how the great men and women of God understood prayer. And this is how I want you to understand prayer. Vitally important. Prayer is vitally important for God being able to work in your life, work in your circumstances, work in someone's salvation, because it is the way that he has hardwired the world to work because he has attached himself to prayer. And this is all that I want you to know for now concerning prayer. God has attached himself 
to prayer. That when we pray, he works. And when we don't pray, he doesn't. And the more you are convinced of this, the more you will pray. So next time I speak, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this subject. But I want to close with a quote by the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Notice what he says. Prayer bends omnipotence of heaven to your desire. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Wow, great quote. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world, and it moves the all-powerful God to action. And that is exactly right, because this is how God has chosen to work in the world through the prayers of his people. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for this tremendous truth. I thank you, God, that you have revealed right now to so many people that prayer is what you have attached yourself to and, God, that you work when we pray. <laughs> I don't really understand that all, but I know that that's the case. You work when we pray. And, God, that your hand is moved when we pray. You're, you're, you are prone to action when we pray, God. So I pray that we would be convinced of this, that when we pray, you work. When we don't pray, you don't. And God, that, that, would, that would make every person say, man, I'm going to commit to pray for my kids, commit to pray for my future, commit to pray against the devil, commit to pray for my marriage, that we would just be praying as Martin Luther was saying, I cannot afford but to spend three hours of prayer every day to God. So Lord, I pray that you would convince us of this mighty truth. So, Lord, help us as we gather together, God, that we would spur each other on, encourage each other, bring clarity where there is confusion, God, and help us, Lord, to develop community with one another. But, Lord, thank you for this moment. Thank you, God, for revealing your heart to us. I pray, God, that we would obey you in the area of praying. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I am so glad that you worship Jesus with Box Church. Know that this is just the beginning point for your box for the rest of the week. Again, this is about living in community with one another. So eat together, take the Lord's Supper together, pray together, get to know one another, and enjoy the company of those in your box, and spend time thinking about how you can financially bless the community, the nation, and the world. And when you gather together again, do so in the company of new people that you have brought to the Lord. Continue to be the church and continue to bless the community right where you are.